Hello, everybody. Welcome to Global Party Healing on All Levels. We have another fabulously great speaker. I mean, just look how gorgeous she is. So you know that anything that comes out of Adrian's mouth is just going to be so filled with love. In fact, that's like her tagline, always love. Today's segment, we're going to be talking about how she's healed herself with art therapy and how she helps others do the same. So Adrian is joining us from her home in um, the Toronto area in Canada. So welcome, Adrian. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you decided to do this because I just, I was just guided. There was this feeling to reach out to you and it was just like, yes, there, there's something enormous, I feel, that you need to share. I had no idea what, and when you then opened up and told me what you've been healing, it just spoke right to my heart. So why don't you first, before we get into the story about how you healed, um, when I asked you about a song, you picked what song? The, uh, the song that I really resonate with is called Glorious. Uh, it's by the uh, One Voice Choir, uh, mm -hmm. Children's Choir, um, and it is a Mormon's choir. I, um, I feel the words, the, words, the words really resonate with everyone because within, within each and every one of us, we are divine beings and we are glorious. And we have our own gifts to offer and um, our, each, each one of us is unique and special. So true. We're gonna listen to a little bit about this. Obviously, it's gonna sound a little tinny through this technology. We'll put the link below and you can get to hear the whole song after. So here we go. There are times when you might feel aimless. You can't see the places you belong, but you will find that there is a purpose to live there within you alone. When you're near it, you can almost hear it. It's like a symphony, just keep listening. And pretty soon you start to figure out Everyone plays a piece And there are melodies Each one of us Oh, it's glorious Do you know what is amazing about that piece when I first heard it was I like to use the analogy that it is a universal symphony and that each of us are like that one note. And as long as we play that note and trust, you know, that's all we need to do, then we really are always love. Yes. I get very emotional when I hear that song, no matter how many times I, I listen to it. It's just, uh, it's very profound for me. So I'm so, glad you like it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we want to share with the viewers a little bit about what you have overcome because grief, grief. can be overwhelming. And especially with the twins. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So I've been on this journey for 27 months now. I, um, I was an identical twin, two minutes apart, mono mono twins, one, one placenta. We were two minutes apart and uh, very close. My mom didn't know she was having twins. Um, I, uh, my, my, my twin suffered uh, seizures for the last five years from a head injury. Mm -hmm. and, and she'd been okay for seven months prior to her passing and um we spoke every day we were very close and uh she um i said i had said goodbye to her that afternoon just before i went to work and then i on my day off the next day i went to find her and she was she wasn't there and i, I felt very strange um because twins have a very strange bond um which i now know is intuition 
and it's uh, I used to think it was a sixth sense or something psychic or whatever, but now I'm, I know it's not. It's none of those things. It's we were just so connected in in, in every way, and um, we we went through a lot, a lot uh, in our very uh, early. Uh, formative years together, um, which made our bond even closer because mm -hmm. we only had each other. Uh, very long story. Anyway, um, I couldn't find her that day, and uh, I thought, oh well, she's at she she was a social worker, and she um, she went to the hospital, had meetings with ladies and things. I thought she was there. The meeting went ran ran late, but you know that the whole day back then was just gray. It was a snowstorm. I was nauseated. I felt out of sorts. Um, my mom was coming back from Fort Lauderdale, and I had our dog, and I was dropping off the dog, and I thought, the plane's going to crash. Like, I had all these weird feelings, Like I, and I thought, you know, we could get a grip. The plane's not going to crash, but I felt out of sorts and strange, and I just couldn't figure out what it was. On the way home, it, we started having a snowstorm, and I... Um, I had to stop at a gas station and I was violently ill. I started vomiting. And I, I came home, I was lying on the couch in front of the fire for a few minutes, talking to my daughters. One was at university at the time, the other one was at Tribes. And then the doorbell rang. And I thought, I'm not answering the door, <laughs> not in a snowstorm, and who could it be? And my husband, bless him, he, uh, he came down the stairs and he's like, sweetheart, like, you have to answer the door. And I'm like, no, I. It could be anybody. So all of a sudden, I heard my husband saying my name in a very strange way. He never calls me Adrian. And he said, Adrian, you have to come to the door. And um, I got up and I went around the corner and I saw the police officers there, a chair and a bowl. And all these things are going through your mind. Uh, oh, I'm just like, okay, I just spoke to my mom, my, my daughters, and all these things. And I'm thinking, like, well, what could this be? And I got four feet away from one of the officers, and um, I knew, and I collapsed, and I was just, um, I don't know what I was. Mm -hmm. but, um, I, they took me to the couch. I don't remember a lot. Um, a very good friend came over, and she just held me on the couch all night long. I wanted to go, my, my sister was in St. Catharines. I wanted to go there. I, I needed to see her, I needed to find her because um, they didn't know how she had died and they didn't call me for 12 hours until, uh, until after they found her. Um, because they, they, this is gonna sound awful, but they, they treat everything like that as a, a suspicious death, a crime scene. So um, once, uh, once, and nothing really hit, nothing really, like, I couldn't feel her, I couldn't find anything, I couldn't breathe, I, I was vomiting, it was, it was awful. Um, I, um, I never did get to see my sister. Um, the pathologist would not let me, nor would uh, the funeral home, because of the autopsy. Um, so I dressed her in, um, purple was her favorite color, and long ear. Um, I had them put her clothes in and I had her, her thumbprint made out of sterling silver and um, I think that's the only thing in, in my process of grief and I just finished a bereavement group and we were talking about the things uh, at funerals and stuff and you know I people call it closure and I, I don't think you ever get closure um, but if I if I could have held her um, or, or uh, I, I just feel like she vanished like I never got to say goodbye to her so um, the funeral was very emotional. Uh, I did a nearly 10 page eulogy. I wrote it 10.30 the night before. I don't know how I wrote it. My daughters were on either side of me. And um, I went back to work the next day. Wow. I, everyone was saying, keep going, keep going. And you know, our society, you know, God bless people, we just, uh, out of fear, out of whatever it is. Nobody would talk to me. No. They were terrified of me. They didn't know what to say. There was one girl who bought me this beautiful card and she hugged me in the parking lot and she was, she was lovely. But it just, um, 
for the next nine months, it was just, it was a nightmare. Um, I would get in my car on the way home and I would scream and cry. And in the morning, my husband would wake me up and I would literally walk for two hours, get myself together. He would make my lunch. He would do everything. I would have to take some gravel. Um, and then I was, I was living on those drinks, those insured drinks for four months. And I lost a lot of weight. Um, and I was in shock. And then the, it was September the 9th, I said to, to uh, doctor, the doctor I was working with, um, I'm sorry, I'm giving my notice. And he hugged me and he said, are we okay? And I said, yes, I just, I, I have some work to do here. <laughs> and so um, the two weeks didn't follow. I ended up in the hospital two days later. I had an absolute total crash. Um, some people call it, a, I don't know what having a nervous breakdown is, but it was, it was some kind of very profound event. Right. And I realized I hadn't dealt with it. Nobody at the hospital knew how to deal with it. Uh, nobody knew anything about twin grief. Right. Twins, nobody wants to talk about it. They wanted to give me a lot of drugs, keep me very drugged. Uh, I don't know if they thought I was going to commit suicide or, or what they thought. Um, and my husband bought me coloring books and I started to color. And then we had, we had art therapy in the hospital um, also twice a week. I think it was yeah, twice a week. And um, I had never painted or, or taken art in my life. My, my twin was, Diana was the, the artsy one, the, the very creative one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I was, in my family, I, I had to be in sciences and math and, and, and go that route. Um, being creative was, no, you didn't do things like that. You, you, it was all academia. So, so you're kind of, one was love more than and, and you're, Right. I, I'm wondering that now. Yes, yeah. Um, we were very this. We were very the same in many ways. Um, certainly, um, physically and, and our appearance and everything. However, we, in our in our minds, um, our passions were the same, but but we did have differences. They say the only thing different on with identical twins is their fingerprints. Um, so that's why I have Di's fingerprint. So anyway, I started painting in the hospital and um, it, it gave me such solace, such peace. I didn't have to talk to anyone um, and answer what I felt were very, very trivial, basic questions that weren't really solving anything. Journaling, journaling helped, but I was, I was in such a state that I, that I couldn't write. So the, the painting just came about. And um, when I went home, my husband, my husband, God bless him, he's just, he's a rock. We've been together a very long time and he's just, he's just, he's an incredible person. He went and got all these art supplies and um, I started painting. I ended up in the hospital um, two more times that year. Mm -hmm. uh, once was to, to come off all of the drugs that they had me on in the first time. And the second time I, I, I did get ill. So, um, sorry. No, so you're doing when it comes to grief, um, I feel our culture, our, in, in Canada and the United States, uh, our culture's uh, very, <sighs> what's the word, backwards? Um, I don't know, we were, we don't, we don't how to handle it. Pardon? We just don't know how to handle it, really, we right? Like, it's, it's like to honor it. I feel I feel like people and even myself sometimes the recognition of someone else's grief is is like recognizing the sorrow inside yourself. Yes. And nobody wants to go there and realize they're not happy in their own life. Mm -hmm. Right? And right. So, you know we love to share our happiness. Woo, go Jays, you know? Oh yeah, I know. But when it comes to grief, we're we're like, don't tell me, I can't have, I can't. Have. No, I was. Um, my whole world walked away from me. They like literally. It was the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to me. I I realized um, 
I was extremely alone. Nobody, you know, after two months, everyone was like, well, you should be over this by now. And um, nobody would talk about it. And I, I literally became um, isolated and reclusive. It was, uh, it was just this, this process inside my head was like, why, why are people being this way? Like, I just, I, I, I just, I didn't understand any of it, you know, and, and people say things to you like, oh, she's in a better place. Um, or she didn't suffer the coroner. I didn't find out how, how Di died until three months to the date of her death, which was she had a grand mal seizure and suffocated in her pillow. It was an accident. And um, the coroner kept calling me. And uh, Richard was his name. He was a lovely, lovely man and asking me questions. And, um, you know, he would talk to me and he was amazing. And then I would go on, you know, TED Talks or on YouTube, trying to find things on twin grief. Right. Uh, Mary Morgan, who started Twinless Twins um, in the United States um, after 9-11, she sent me her book. Um, and she is a lovely, lovely woman. And I tried to start Twinless Twins. I tried to start a Facebook page for Twinless Twins. And I, I met the most beautiful, beautiful woman in, the wor in this world. Um, Jenny, she lost her twin six weeks before I lost mine mm -hmm. to bladder cancer. She's in Australia, <laughs> but we talk not, not every day, but every second or third day. Um, we've gone on this journey together, and um, she's been a lifeline because she, she really understands. I've met other twins um, who didn't quite have the same bond that my sister and I had. And um, I thought they would understand. But again, I think until it happens to you, um, you don't understand. Right. And then you know, the comments of, you know, getting over it, or you should do this, or you should do that. Instead of, instead of someone's coming to you and saying, how are you today? And letting you be. Right. You know, I, I, my husband's Swiss. I used to live in Switzerland. And you know, we have pleasant, pleasantries in our, in our country when we're walking down the street and we're like, hi, how are you? And people say, oh, I'm fine. And, you know, I, I have an acronym for that word, fine. Um, and we carry on our day. Uh, not say it here. But um, when in Switzerland, um, very profound. If, if you asked someone that you met walking, you know, through the village or down the street, up the mountain, whatever, you know, hi, so-and-so, how are you? They, they would stand there sometimes for an hour exactly. and actually tell, tell you how they were. Right. And it was authentic, and it was real, and it, was, it wasn't a pleasantry. It was like, you're asking me how I am, and I'm going to tell you. And that was amazing. It was really, really amazing. And um, here, I think a lot of things are fluffed over. You know, it's, there's so many stigmas attached to, to things. Um, like, uh, like with, with Diana's death, people, you know, like I could hear whispers at the funeral, you know, did she commit suicide? You know, like, and it was like, uh, like I just, there was all these, these innuendos because people don't know. So I felt very alone in my grief until I found these people. Um, I had to deal with, my mom calls me every morning, um, as a mother, I can't imagine losing a child. Um, we were each other's lifeline for, for the first while. But our family got, got very divided within our grief because everyone has different, different uh, Wait. timelines of grief, different. They say there's five stages of grief. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, I think there's more. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I've read many, many books. Um, but I, again, if for each person, and it, it depends on, you know, like losing a child, losing a spouse, you know, some, some people say, oh my God, oh my gosh, Adrian, you lost, you lost your twin sister. Like that is the worst loss. And I say, a loss is a loss. If it's a twin, a child, a spouse, a, a, a parent, a loss is a loss, a job, any kind of a thing. We, we grieve so many things in our life that we don't uh, pay attention to. Um, and if we stuff, you know, the, the dirty little secret of grief, and there's a lot of secrets to grief that people do not share with you. And that's why I call it my, the dirty little secrets of grief. Um, 
you know, let's just sweep it under the carpet and it's, we're not going to talk about it and, and it's going to go away. And, um, you know, internally we can get emotionally and, and physically quite ill doing things like that. Um, because, you know, when, when you, when you stuff things, um, th they're going to eventually come out. Yeah. I, um, I call 2017 my year of crazy because I ran around, I co-authored a book and wrote some articles. I, I was on TV doing these, these things. I was doing all sorts of crazy things. Um, not crazy things, but like trying to, I was trying to find comfort. I was trying to find, um, I was trying to find out how to be uh, a me instead of a we, how to be, um, I didn't know. I'd never, I never known. I always had, you know, if something exciting happened or something, you know, anything happened, I would run to the phone and, you know, run in the house and it was like, hi, Di. And we'd have these long talks every morning. And, um, my, my husband realizes now too, that he was married to the both of us, to two of us. And that, um, you know, he had, he had a big grieving process too. It, um, and my daughters, um, so everyone grieved at the same time, uh, at different times, pardon me. And, um, it's, they say the second year is, is the hardest, but I'm, I, I've been having a, a, a really hard time this week. Uh, I don't know why I just finished a bereavement, uh, group and it brought up a lot of stuff. So, you know, people call it the new normal, which is like this <laughs> term in, 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 in grief. Right. So the new normal. I don't know if I've gotten my mind around that, that concept or whatever, because, um, you know, it, it's, it's not normal to me. I, I never, I never, ever in my life envisioned um, my, my twin sister dying. Right. I, I think, actually, Adrian, there's a very good point that I want to make. Most of us are used to being an individual, right? Most of the world is used to being an individual. And we're talking about moving from just thinking about yourself to someone else. You and every other identical twin are really already one, but in two, right? You're a we, like you said. And, and now you like almost funny the whole current of what, you know, like, it's, it's a very big, I think it's a very big, example of how you've kind of pulled away you've been it's not like you decided to from you like something apart from yourself yes and it, it's like an open wound it's not like you can band it because it's it's like you've just been ripped apart and and there's all this healing to do because you used to be two of you like two in a sense with one and yeah we who've only ever been one can't really come to him because we're trying to get to that one like you were with two but we have so yeah i was i was like her mom i was i was first born and i i took care of her in, in many ways i was uh they well they always say there's an alpha twin and a uh, a beta twin and uh, one stronger than the other um, usually the firstborn I can tell with other identical twins who was born first just just by interacting with them um, the one person has a, a more dominant personality I did take care of Jack it was people thought it was strange um, and I and I, I did ask her why once but um, again, uh, a lot of things did happen with us in, in younger years, and um, but we all we were always kept together, and um, we always had each other. So this, um, I've, ha I've had I've had a lot of other grief in my life, but it's been different, and um, I still wake up in the night, not being able to breathe, searching for her, trying to find something that I can hold on to, like something that is. I still have some of her Kleenex that was in her pocket and her jacket and I smell it and I hold it. I go to the mirror and I, 
I mean, I posted about this uh, on Facebook. It's called Reflections. And I, I would stand in front of the mirror and, and try to find her in me, um, in, in, in an emotion, a look, a glance, her voice, a shadow. Um, just, 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 just to find some kind of essence of her. Um, and, and again, it's, it sounds kind of like it was, I was trying to, to find her because such a big part of me is gone. And I have to accept that. And um, that is why my, my art therapy has filled this big void. Like I don't, I don't sleep most nights. Um, and I, I just come in here and, and I paint or I write. And it's, um, it's very cathartic. It's very comforting. And, and so when you said before that you really weren't the painter, so you started doing the coloring and now are you just, are you flowing with creativity that you just were unaware of? Do you feel like it's your sister's creativity that is working through you? Um, people have said that. I, I think when you um, have any kind of very uh, traumatic event, a loss, mm -hmm. um, and people people perceive you to be broken or damaged. Um, it's it's like in, in in Japan where they make these bowls yeah. or, or broken. Um, I I cannot I would say the word but I cannot pronounce it, um, and they fill it with gold yeah. um, because it is still beautiful. And and where that gold is, the light shines through. Diana's death brought me many gifts, brought me my gifts to myself um, of the light shining through, um, the depth of grief um, and anguish. I was just like, just uh, in the in this, this, they call it the dark night of the soul, but it was it was just so intense that it 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 you know I've been on my knees many times, but it I mean I stayed there a lot longer and it. Um, it's changed me to a, uh, into a, a different person and, and I will never be the, the person that I was before. And um, a lot of stuff that was stuffed inside of me that I was told I couldn't be when I was growing up um, has all come out. You know, I, to be, I had to be a doctor or a lawyer or you know, something along those lines to be respectable. And, uh, um, to be an amazing woman and strong and, 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 you know, make all this money and, and do all this stuff. And, um, I mean, I did want to be a veterinarian, uh, and I ended up be becoming a veterinary uh, a nurse, which, which I do love, but I did that later in life, you know, after I had my, my children, I went back to school. Um, but this whole, um, my creativity, um, my art, my writing, um, has all come out, uh, through Diana's death and trying to, I'm never going to have closure. So I, I don't like that word because I, I don't think you ever do. I think you just, uh, I think, you know, acceptance, acceptance is a big, is a big thing that I, I still, like even today, my, my heart went into my stomach twice driving when I drove past the GO train station on Main Street in Markham. I don't know if you yeah. remember it. Oh, we were and I could see her standing there, you know, waving, and I, I caught myself, you know, and um, I get very, very, I, I get very, very triggered. Um, and I have a therapy dog called Annie. She comes with me most places I go. Um, and it's that comfort of just having someone else there. Um, Annie's a dog, she's not a human, but... Um, she's uh she's very comforting and i don't feel so like my, my mom said you must feel like an orphan and i said i i don't i don't know what i feel i just i just, I just felt so lost and disconnected right. there was such a disconnect from the world and reality because i just i i couldn't process it you know so i it, i can only I can I've only come across once in my life someone that lives very close to me. 
And I remember going to the party. It was up in the Horseshoe Valley. And uh, my friends came running out. They went, oh my gosh, there's a girl in there that looks just like you. And I remember going in and, and she did look a lot like me, right? And I could just, even in the sense of watching her, right? And, and that was just two people that were separate, but seeing, it's like seeing yourself in the mirror. And so I can only imagine what it would be like to share everything with your sister. Like it's like, it's, in, it's like a part of you died, right? And, and how, how can anybody say get over it? Because it's like a part of you. Yeah, it's um, when people, when you, when you look at each other when you're twins and if, if the other one does something, uh, it's just magnified 10 times more. It's like, oh my gosh, do, like, do I look or it's like, don't say that or do that because it's, it's like, it's like, it's like mirror twins. It's like an image of you, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know um, that huge hole that is still there. Um, and I don't know if, if it'll always be there or if it gets better. I just go one day at a time right now, but that, that hole is, um, I've learned, you know, running around with, you know, doing all these different projects that, um, I had to be still, I had to be still and I had to listen and go within. And I had to process everything because what I was doing was getting outside comfort from all these different venues just to avoid this pain that was insurmountable, like literally insurmountable. And um, it, uh, I had to work through it. And it was really hard work. And, um, it, uh, I cried a lot. It was very cathartic, but then I'd have to revisit things, you know, like, you know, peeling off the layers of an onion type thing I use as an, an, an analogy, pardon me. Right. Um, and I still have so far to go. I mean, I'm just feeling like I'm just starting to, to actually, I don't know what the word is. Um, I, I still wake up and my, my heart still falls into my stomach and I still feel like I can't breathe and I can't go certain places and I can't do certain things because I just get so triggered. It's, it, it's awful. Um, but there is a, there's now it's like, okay, she's gone and she's not coming back. And when I first started painting, I was painting angels all the time. And, and, and heaven, because mm -hmm. I was trying to, my, my, my big thing was that, that upset me so much was I didn't know where she was. I didn't know, um, being brought up Roman Catholic, you know, we're, we're taught, you know, we go to purgatory and, and you know, or hell, like, God forbid, um, and all these awful places and, and, and things. And um, she was a very spiritual person. And uh, I kept wondering, you know, where is she? Who's she with? What's she, what's she doing? Like, what, what have they done with her? Whoever, whoever they are. And um, so my, my, my world was, was heaven, was um, painting angels all the time. And, um, you know, like the masquerade ball, getting ready for prom, like things that were going on in my daughter's life. Like what, what, what would it be like in heaven um, to, with, with, with the angels choir? And I love to play the flute. I played the piano. It's like, was, is, and she loved to sing. She sang all the time. It's like, is, is she in the choir in heaven? So I, I, I write, pardon me, I paint and write about those kind of things because it, it was very, very disturbing to me for the longest time uh, about where she was. Um, and I have her here. I have a... Uh, uh, an armoire downstairs that is her urn is there 
and um, I have uh, a whole thing made, and I and I go then, and I and I can close the doors, um, because I, again, it disturbs other people, and um, when I need to, I go there and and I sit and I pray and I talk, and sometimes I scream. Once I totally lost it, and I was screaming and yelling at her for dying. Right. And I, thank goodness I had to live in an apartment or something. If the neighbors could hear me, they'd think I was a mad woman. You know, I, but all these things had to come out. Really. Um, it, yeah, because it was just, it, it, none of it made sense. It was just so irrational. Right. Um, so young. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few conversations um, over the party today. Like uh, there was one I was having earlier today with a lady in Australia, um, Leah, and and she was saying the same thing. She unravels physical pain. Is sometimes it's a scream that somebody releases in order to, and their back starts to feel better, right? So this idea of we know what to happen with anybody. And exactly how it's to happen or how you're to handle the grief or pain. It's a really mm -hmm. new system. And we need to each find what works for us to release the feelings that we're having to honor who we are and for you the art. And as you're, you've been doing art, you're sharing your art with others, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, I start. Sorry. No, go ahead. And so are you can you hear? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> you're kind of breaking up. Um, I, uh, I started gifting art to people who were, who were mourning, who had lost their, their mothers or significant others or, or even pets or, and things that made them, that related. You know, like one woman, I, I, I did this thing called Tulips on Fire. And she saw it and she just, she had just lost her mom and, and tulips were for her mom. Like, like her mom loved tulips. So I found out where she lived and I went to her house and she didn't know, she didn't know. And I, I, and I, I gave it to one of her sons. So when she came home, she had this. And um, I, I do a lot of art that way and, and send morning messages. I call them morning messages to people who are, who are grieving um, because, you know, and, we we're all together and we have the funeral and everybody's there and uh, you know then like my family scattered all around the world everybody goes home or back to their daily lives and you know that's when it really starts um and you're 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 there alone going okay like where is everybody and um my my the one doctor i worked with uh he said you know I realized that after my dad died and now I check in. So, so my, my, my big thing is I don't want people to feel that they've been forgotten, that their pain's been forgotten mm -hmm. and to wake up to morning messages to, 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 for whatever they're going through to, to make them feel that, that they're still loved and that people still know that, that they're hurting and, and that they can call. Um, or, or paint pictures for them, like like when Smiley, the blind therapy dog, passed away. Um, I painted a picture of him, and um, it was a very private, personal thing because I got to meet him six months uh, after Diana died, and um, he brought a lot of comfort to me. And um, so I, I, I really, I'm an empath, but I, I believe that I. We, we have to take care of each other um, and remember that what, you know, so many people are waking up every morning to, um, to things that are just, you know, people complain, oh, I've got to go to work, I've got to put the coffee on, or I've got to walk the dog, and, and some people have no idea what some people wake up to. Um, some people can't even get out of bed. So it's, um, it's just letting them know that they're loved and um opening up the conversation that it, it's okay to 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 scream and cry and the only thing you get done that day is brush your teeth it, it's okay not to be able to move it's 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 okay when when there's anniversaries to have a meltdown you know 
just just don't stay there like you have a meltdown but you get up and you go and um it's uh talking to people about grief when, when i went to this last grief uh, this bereavement program um that was put on by my church and i, I don't believe in accidents I, i'm very much into synchronicity and how i found this flyer because i had no idea and i met these incredible people and uh, one of the facilitators had actually lost uh, twin babies and uh, it was very very unique group I think it was about 15 of us um, I was the, the youngest person in terms of of length of time of my, of my significant person passing away some of these people their loss had been five nine eleven thirteen years uh, and they were still stuck in in what what has been what what they've called my grief which is they they called it complicated grief and post traumatic stress stress disorder. Um, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I think um, I think when I, when we have a loss of any kind, it's a, it's a trauma yeah. to 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 everyone, right? So I I don't know about that, but you know, just listening to these people um, really made me feel that I was okay. I, I was normal for the first time in, in since this happened. And uh, Marianne Williamson, you know, she's wrote this incredible book called From, From Tears to Triumph, right. which is just beautiful. Um, and I have a group of ladies we do A Course of Miracles in, with and, and uh, Marianne Williamson every Tuesday night. And um, my daily readings of grief. And um, if someone says to me, you know, like, aren't you over that yet? Or like, why, why can't you still go here? It's like, I don't have to explain. I don't have to answer. It's my heart. I don't want to affect anyone uh, or make anyone feel uncomfortable. And um, it's, it's where I am and who I am right now. And so. I think that is such an important message because as we're healing, everyone's at a different place. Everyone's at a different perspective and to honor each other, to really love always, as you were saying, is to honor and respect where each person is and just to hold them in that, that space and send them love and trust and believe that they're each going to receive what they need. And it can be an entirely different journey than your best friend would take you know, or the person closest to you. And sometimes we need to let go of that person in order to go on the journey. But when we really love and support each other, we're allowing each other to do that, to heal mm -hmm. on all levels. Yes, I had to, I had to leave a lot of people in my life for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and said, so, you know, I love you. I just, I, I cannot have you in my life right now. I, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a mission. <laughs> it's your, a, 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 a journey. I, I call it my mission. Um, because I realized that I was, you know, running around being this fake fraudulent person, putting on this smile and being all happy to make them happy. Right. And that's not authentic. That's not real. That's, that's not who I am. I'm dying inside. I want to scream. I want to run from the room, right. but I'm being happy so that everyone else is happy and i i didn't want to live like that anymore that that was injuring my soul and it wasn't honoring who i am as a person so um i'm i'm very reclusive and and isolated right now um and it's it's part of the the most heaviest dark night of the soul that i've had however I know that the work that I'm doing right now, the sacred transformation that is going to happen after this dark night of the soul is going to be, I just feel it. Something's happening. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's going. Um, but I just feel it's going to be wonderful. And I'm going to find my place. I'm going to, to find out where I'm, I'm, I'm where my where the next level is where I fit in where I'm supposed to go and all the answers will come mm -hmm. however I must do this work first right 
the analogy that comes to my mind is the caterpillar and becoming the butterfly. So you're in the craziness. And I heard the other day that there comes a point where the caterpillar senses realizing that the cells of the butterfly are starting to become more. And the caterpillar wants to, in a sense, you know, that's the dark night of the soul, wants to defeat the butterfly, doesn't want to let go. Exactly. And, but then, you know, the whole idea of transformation is complete. You know, that's it. It's a rebirth. You, a butterfly can never see life the same way as a caterpillar. And for some of us, that chrysalis can be, you know, very quick. And for others, it can be a whole life. Well, I have a, a post I made um, on from Canva. I, I make some sayings on some of my art. And, and one of them is, um, funny enough, is uh, you, cannot, you cannot speak butterfly language with caterpillars. So um, that's interesting that you said that. I, I, that, I didn't make that up. I, I don't know who did, but it, it's a quote out there. And um, I have that on my Facebook page because it is so true. No, it's um I think that what you're sharing here is so essential because I just I just spent a couple of days with the grade one class here. And the story I told the grade ones on the first day was the little boy and the little girl seemed happy on the outside. Mm -hmm. But inside they weren't happy, right? And basically the story poured out of me and I said, but and then they went out and they saw this tree and this tree was there and this tree was just waving in the wind saying, come hug me, come hug me, you know? And these little six-year-olds were just, half of them had their mouths open to every word that I was saying. And the other, I gave them paper to color what they liked and what they didn't like about the story. Some didn't color, some were coloring in the beginning. And then I had them, you know, give away the idea when they hugged the tree give away things that they didn't like about the story. And some of the little boys that I would have already said that are experiencing their own dark night of the school at six didn't want to yep. give away any of the negative things. They wanted to give away the happy things. Oh. And and I I had to look at that and go, wow, you know, this is what's going on at this age already, right? Yep. And so this isn't where we go, put on a happy face, smile, just keep doing and learning and doing things. This is where we need to already start to work on. So 20 years from now, we're not, oh, there's an emotional or a mental issue that needs to be taken care of, right? So grief that you experience needs to be released. And you're sharing this story has been so helpful for so many because they're saying, oh my gosh, You've just given me permission to share. You've given me permission to honor myself and realize it's okay where I'm at, that people around me don't understand, but my heart is still healing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. I hope that we can connect again. Um, but where can people find you if they would like to connect and do some art therapy? Um. I have a uh, Facebook page. It's mm -hmm. called Adrian's Adventures in Art Therapy. Uh, uh, we also have a website we've just put up. It's, it's very new. I'm in the new stages of all this. Um, www, well, the, the website is on, on the Facebook page, uh, www.adriansadventuresinarttherapy.ca. And uh, most of my paintings are there. Um, the uh, I, I, I did have an art show um, in honor of my twin. I wanted to honor her somehow. And um, I sold 90 pieces of art. Wow. Uh, people drove for miles, miles away. We had no idea. And um, it was, uh, there was, the room was filled with all these people I had met through grief online. I'd never met them in person. And it was a very spiritual, very, very... Um, surreal place in, in this in, in this art show in this cafe and it was it was beautiful um and people started saying you know it's like start selling your art like that's what you're supposed to do um i don't know about that yet but we're still in the process of um making people do buy art and um 
they, they, they send and they ask me to paint certain things, which I find extremely difficult because uh, my art is coming from my heart and, and from my, my grief. But uh, if they want to look at stuff, they can, they can go there. Beautiful. And we'll have the links below too, but uh, yes, really allow yourself to have to feel for sure. Have a beautiful yes. day, everybody. Thank you so much, Jenny, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you I for having you. me. Love you too. Bye.